Some people say that rules were made to be broken. Others say the rules are the rules for a reason. Then Jesus comes along and says, people, it's not even about the rules. So what does he mean? That all the boundaries are gone and we can just live any way we want? No, Pastor Mike says that something even better than that, and we'll explore it together today. Stay with us. When I was just getting started in ministry, I had the privilege of being a middle school youth pastor. That's right, privilege, 12 to 14 years old, all in the same sentence, and I had a lot to learn. And one of the things that I did was I would visit different youth groups and figure out what other people were doing. And I went to the biggest church in town and asked if I could observe one of their services. And they said, sure. So I got my badge and went to the service. And it began with this long list of rules. Don't do this. Don't do that. Don't hang on this. Don't throw that. Don't spit. Don't pull people's hair. I mean, if it was on there, I figured, well, someone probably did it at one point. And then uh, as the, the music began, I noticed there were in the stadium style seating, there were men standing up in the aisles with their backs to the stage. And they would stand there with their, their arms behind their backs, looking like bouncers at a nightclub. And as I was fascinated watching these guys, I saw them snap their fingers and point at people. And they would point at the kids and they would be quiet. And I was like, whoa, this vibe is a little, uh, <laughs> a little intense for me. And also, I'm an adult. And I'm wondering if I'm breaking one of these rules because I can't remember them all. Well... I went to another youth group and saw uh, their their service, and I really had dots connect for me when they said, hey, if you're new here, we're so glad you're here, and we don't have a long list of complicated rules. rules. We've just got one rule. Everybody say respect. And of course, all the middle schoolers and all the volunteers and, and me, the observer, said respect. He said, that's all you got to do to filter whether something's okay or not. Are you respecting other people? Are you being respectful of God? Are you being respectful of the facility? And all this, you could almost feel the tension go out of the room because everyone thought, okay, I can do that. And if I'm not being respectful, I can probably notice and self-correct. So if you're new around here, <laughs> when it comes to practicing the way of Jesus, where you start makes a huge difference. So this is, for those of you who've been following Jesus for a long time, this message is for you. For those of you who are brand new to this, this message is for you too. Because where we start out, are we going to start out with a long list of rules? Or are we going to start out by talking about what's inside our hearts and where are our hearts pointed? So when it comes to following Jesus, the starting point makes all the difference. You know, where was your starting point in your spirituality, in your walk with Jesus? Was it the culture? Was it just the air that you breathed that everyone went to church and everyone is doing this? So I'm kind of going along with everybody else. Was your starting point maybe a church tradition or a denomination? Like you just grew up in that and that's why you behave the way you do. Well, sometimes those things get intermingled and we, we can confuse what is the message of Jesus with something that we got from our culture or our tradition. Well, I want to take a look today about, uh, take a look at what it means to radically follow Jesus. This Jesus who is a first century Jewish rabbi in this, in this culture and context. And in his context, he was a revolutionary his message and his life example is when you look at that and, and strip it away of, of art that you've seen of Jesus or, or maybe a cultural definition, when we get to know Jesus in the scriptures, we see that there was a reason he was crucified. There was a reason that he stirred the pot. 
And we, we get past the, some of the cultural assumptions of people saying, oh, he was just a great teacher and just kind of this fluffy, warm and fuzzy thing. That's thinking about Jesus without the revolution. Other people see Jesus as so revolutionary that he left his religion behind altogether and just said, forget it, I'm starting something brand new. But if we look at Jesus in the scriptures, we see how he held these two things together. Yes, he was a great teacher. Yes, he was a revolutionary. But he held up all of Israel's story. And the whole time, Israel's story was pointing to him. So I want to clear up some of that tension, but also maybe just hit the reset button for us. And maybe we can get to know Jesus in a brand new way in the time that we can spend together. So let's look at Jesus's mission and why he came to this world in his own words. We see this in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, anyone who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So, for our time today, this is part one. I've got two parts to this. Part one of diving into the teachings of Jesus is love must overcome law. So D- Jesus is saying, "I okay, there's a fuss here. I haven't come to do away with the law. What was all the fuss about? Why is Jesus even having to explain that he hasn't come to do away with something but to fulfill it? Well, let's take a look at just a few of these. We could spend hours and days and weeks talking about all the different examples, but I'll just pick out a couple of them from one of Uh, your favorite books of the Bible, if you've been around church for a while. Leviticus. What? Okay. Leviticus chapter 11. There's this long list that God was giving to the children of Israel about what you can and what you can't eat. And I'll I'll just pick out a little portion of, of this passage. In Leviticus 11, it starts out, The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Say to the Israelites, Of all the animals that live on land, these are the ones you may eat. You may eat any animal that has a divided hoof and that chews the cud. There are some that only chew the cud or only have a divided hoof, but you must not eat them. The camel, though it chews the cud, does not have a divided hoof. It is ceremonially unclean for you. The hyrax, Though it chews the cud, does not have a divided hoof. It is unclean for you. And it continues, and so on and so forth. And I know, I get your emails all the time. You're wondering, is it okay to eat a hyrax? Well, according to Leviticus chapter 11, it was not okay for the children of Israel as they were getting settled into this new life. They couldn't eat the hyrax. So for hundreds of years, this is this chapter forms the boundaries of what the Israelites could and couldn't eat. And talk about getting something deep into your culture. And and this effect, it literally shapes you. You are what you eat. Generation after generation eating this kosher food. And we find ourselves in first century Israel. And here comes Jesus, Matthew chapter 7. And after he left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. Are you so dull, he asked? Don't you see that nothing that enters a person from the outside can defile them? For it doesn't go into their heart, but into their stomach and then out of the body. In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. This was a big deal. It stirred the pot after how many centuries of tradition Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. It's about the heart. What comes out of your heart is what makes you unclean. Also in Jewish culture, 
the Sabbath, the resting for 24 hours once a week, big deal. It goes all the way back to the beginning. Even God did this. Jesus also stirs the pot here, some Sabbath stuff. In the book of Jeremiah chapter 17, this is what the Lord says. Be careful not to carry a load on the Sabbath day or bring it through the gates of Jerusalem. Do not bring a load out of your house or do any work on the Sabbath, but keep the Sabbath day holy as I commanded your ancestors. We'll skip to verse 27. But if you do not obey me to keep the Sabbath day holy by not carrying the load as you come through the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle an unquenchable fire in the gates of Jerusalem that will consume her fortress. So God's speaking through the prophet Jeremiah pretty seriously. God doesn't want any work done on the Sabbath. Flash forward to the time of Jesus. And in the book of John, uh, in the chapter 4, beginning of chapter 5, Jesus is going around and healing people. He's doing all this work on the Sabbath day. Jesus is doing stuff on the Sabbath day. John 5, picking up in verse 16. So because Jesus was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, My father is always doing his work to this very day. I too am working. So not only does Jesus heal people on the Sabbath, he's healed people in the synagogue. He's told people to get up and take their mat and walk. He has the audacity to call it work. He's he's not just... He's not being obstinate. He's purposefully showing people that what God's heart is. Then there's other examples of, of what you're not supposed to do according to what the Jewish people called the Torah or the law. You weren't supposed to touch unclean things, touch sick people, uh, talk to outsiders. And Jesus continually he touches lepers to heal them, touching the blind, talking to Samaritans. And this is one concept that I love. It's called the grace contagion. And Jesus, by his example and by his teaching, shows that whatever he touches, it turns from unclean to clean, from sinner to saved, from something that was defiled to something that's set apart and holy because Jesus has the grace contagion. He doesn't have to worry about cooties. Whatever he touch is made clean. So He calls all these people to follow him, to apprentice under him, and that call and invitation is still open to you and me to this very day. And Jesus calls us into a rule-free, principle-based spirituality. And that's so hard to grasp for religious people. And when I say the word religious people, I mean going through religion in the way I define it. It's going through rituals and depending on these empty rituals to save you. Jesus says, no, the rituals are fine. I assume that you're going to do a lot of those things. I want you to know me. Jesus doesn't want you to know about him. He wants you to know him. So rather than giving us a bunch of rules, Jesus took the principles out of here. And they're they're embedded within the rules And Jesus wrapped those principles in a human life, in in his flesh and blood. So the entire life of Jesus and his teachings and his example becomes God's word to us. So he's definitely stirred the pot. We looked at a few of those examples. Just going back to his words that we read earlier, in Matthew chapter 5, 17, he says, Don't think I've come to abolish the law. So why does he need to assure people that he's not trying to get rid of that? Well, the next comment that that we read gives us a clue. He's come to fulfill them. What in the world world does that mean? He's come to fulfill the law and the prophets. It means he's going to absorb them into his life, 
to show humanity a better way of life than just merely obeying the letter of the law, like this external for show kind of thing. Jesus is after human hearts. Now, some of you may be thinking, okay, sweet, we're off the hook. We can just do whatever we want. Woo! It's all about Jesus. Well, is that true? According to Jesus, no. No, he, he, he says, I haven't come to abolish the law and the prophets. And he continues on and says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus is challenging his followers to have righteousness. What does that mean? It means right living. He's challenging these listeners to have righteousness that surpassed the the religious leaders of the day. And they meticulously followed these external rules and regulations. And they were called Pharisees. Now, Pharisees, a lot of this is refresher for those of you who grew up in church. Pharisees would be like in modern day times, if they moved into your neighborhood, maybe they're your next door neighbors. Pharisees would actually be good neighbors. I mean, these these are folks that that meticulously follow God's laws, which a lot of God's laws talk about being a good neighbor. <laughs> they, they don't have their music on too late at night. They're not having wild parties till 3 a.m. These Pharisees, you would like, they would be generous. You would notice that, that, that people who go door to door selling things, your Pharisee neighbors would actually be nice to them. Like, what is up with that? They never turn away someone asking for charity. That your Pharisee neighbors would have good kids. But after a while, you would start asking yourself, now, wait a minute. Do these people have any vices? Like, they're a little bit too squeaky clean. Like, are they real? And it might actually make you feel guilty for the way you lead your life. So with all of this, Jesus saying, stirring the pot, saying, I haven't come to to do away with the law. Actually, if you're going to follow me, I want your righteousness to surpass the Pharisees. So that leaves us a few with a few questions. This is part two. A few questions for, for, for this challenge from Jesus to have righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees. Another way to say it might be how to be more fundamentalist than a fundamentalist. So how does that affect us today? Let's go back to Jesus' words again. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, he starts out by saying, You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So Jesus, another way, uh, another translation called the message, uh, instead of saying uh, salt and light, They they translate the idea is that when we're following Jesus, we can become the God flavors and the God colors of this world. So let's think about this. Another question. Where does the world need salt and light right now? Where does our culture need the God flavors and the God colors of this world? I have a, uh, an opinion. This is an opinion. This isn't from the scriptures. I think the most dangerous thing that's that's out for our souls right now isn't some secret like agenda of, of some people trying to rule the world. I think the most dangerous thing in our culture right now that we need to watch out for is how distracted we are. If you can't make someone sin, distract them. If you make them procrastinate. And we have these weapons of mass distraction all over our culture. We have them in our back pockets. 
We have them uh, in restaurants. I, I love my uh, uh, comment my 15-year-old made a couple months ago. We went out, um, just the two of us. Um, she likes ramen. We we're going to get ramen. And we went to a couple different restaurants, which we don't go out to eat very much. So when she walks into a, a restaurant environment, she's very sensitive to it. And she noticed there's TVs all over this restaurant. I want to talk to you. Can we go somewhere different? Sure. No problem. We get back in the car. We drive around for a little bit. Four places we went to before we found a place without a TV in it. And that's, I'm not getting on a soapbox saying, oh, those places are bad. It was, it's an observation that even the act of, we're supposed to eat together. And I, I've noticed this on dates with my wife. I noticed very early on. If I can see a TV, doesn't even, I may not even like what's on. It may be a documentary about Croatian cooking or something like that. Just the movement on the screen gets my attention. And you can imagine if you're out with your person on a date and they keep doing this while you're talking, you don't feel very loved. So now it's muscle memory. When I walk into a restaurant, I make sure I, I, I know where the TV is and I try as much as possible to have my back to it so I can give my sweet Marie my full attention. So where does the world need salt and light right now? I think it's simpler than, than figuring out a lot of the hot button issues out there right now. Just imagine if we were living undistracted, purposeful lives that weren't chained to the winds that toss us to and fro by whatever social media or, or, or programming that we're watching, that we knew how to just be with somebody, how to be comfortable in our own skin. The world needs people who aren't constantly comparing themselves with what they see on, their, on, a, on, a, on a screen that's in their hand or a screen that's attached to a wall. Something is always shaping you. Something is always shaping me. What we read, what we listen to, who we're around, and the media that we consume. The world needs to see people that are shaped by Jesus Christ at the heart of it. And not just on this external kind of a thing. Like we're only ticking the boxes so we look good. But people that are brave enough to say, Jesus, here's my heart. I want to be the salt and light and whatever would keep me from being the God flavors and God colors of the world. Jesus, I surrender that to you. And when you pray that dangerous prayer, Jesus starts to do things. He starts to give you a spiritual heart transplant. You will start to desire different things. So where does the world need to be distracted right now is question number two. A third question. How can we, through following Jesus, provide what the world needs, the salt and light, the good flavors that remind us of God? Well, Jesus called his followers to live by a higher standard. And it's not to try to follow all these laws harder. It means we live the way of love instead of law. What does that mean? We'll go back to the words of Jesus one more time. In Matthew chapter 7, he sums up. I'm a big fan of cliff notes <laughs> or summaries. Here, This sums up the entire Old Testament, the high, entire Jewish Bible, what Christians call the Old Testament. Jesus says, So in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. Jesus is saying all of this stuff matters, but if you want to follow all of this stuff, follow me, follow my example, and also do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I can remember that one. I've been spending some time in Leviticus, which gets picked on so much. It makes sense in context when you really dig in. But if I was trying to, to, to follow that book, there's a lot of things. Eat this, don't eat that. Wear this, don't eat that. I couldn't remember all this. I'm so grateful. And I'm to follow Jesus. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you. Love 
one another. So what does this look like in, in, a, in a real life? What does it look like to follow the heart of the law, not just the external thing, not just the details, but like how to really follow it at the root? Well, an example would be um, my, my kids. They love shoes. They love cool shoes. Uh, I'll pick on my son. He loves, he has a, a, a wish list for his birthday that's coming up. And he knows which soccer shoes he wants. And uh, imagine uh, before a game, he's, he's like, Dad, can I wear my shoes? And I said, sure, you can wear these cool soccer shoes, but those are just for soccer season. So you can wear them around, but don't get them dirty. And he'd say, oh, yes, yes, of course. Well, let's say he puts on these new soccer shoes and they're indoor soccer shoes, so, uh, but he's walking around the neighborhood and then he notices that his friend has fallen into a muddy ditch and has gotten hurt and needs help, like now. It wouldn't be something that makes me happy if he just passed up his friend and said, mm, can't get these shoes dirty. No. Oh. Even a flawed father like me what would want him to go and help his friend out, even if his shoes got a little bit muddy. That's the kind of thing Jesus is, is continually poking at. He came to recalibrate the whole system and to show people what it really meant and to drive home his point. Jesus had to break these rules over and over again to continually point people towards the heart. For instance, in, 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 in his famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, um, and I'm going to put it into my own words, Jesus was basically saying, hey, don't walk around congratulating yourself that you haven't murdered anyone today. Have you had an angry impulse in your heart? Have you killed someone in your heart? That's what Pharisees do. They're like, look, I haven't broken any external, external rules, but their heart was still in need of, of, of salvation. The Pharisees could walk around saying, look, I haven't committed adultery with anyone today. But still, their thoughts and their hearts could still have lust in them. And Jesus is saying, no, my followers, our righteousness needs to exceed that of the Pharisees. Meaning, it doesn't mean we try harder. It means we let Jesus cleanse us from the inside out. So as we wrap up our time today, got a challenge for you from Jesus. I want you to filter your week by Jesus's summary of scripture in Matthew 7, 12. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. For you, maybe this looks like a little sticky note that can act like an anchor for you. Maybe you struggle with road rage. So maybe that's a sticky note of Matthew 7, 12 on your dashboard or on your steering wheel. Someone cuts you off, Matthew 17, <sighs> or, or wherever it is. Maybe it's on your bathroom mirror. Maybe for you, it means putting a reminder on your phone that goes off every few hours or so. And it just pops up, Matthew 17. You can leverage some of these things to, to bring you back to Jesus, whatever that looks like for you. I would love to hear about it over the next week. So as you put on, I, I'm picturing it like Matthew 7, 12 glasses that I'm going to try to see the world through this week. If, uh, if, if something happens to you that, that it's helpful, please let me know and uh, email us. You can go to sgbic.com and, and contact us through there or, or just even leave it in the comments or, or send us a direct message and, uh, and let us know what it was like to radically follow Jesus by trying to literally follow his commandment this week. So let me pray for you and, uh, and we'll dismiss our time together. Father, please continue to uh, work on our hearts. And God, we want to know you. Uh, would you make yourself real to all of us right now? Would you make yourself real to to those folks that do find themselves at the end of their rope and, and they're here in this moment, God, I pray that, that you will nourish their souls right now. And God, give us the courage to follow you. And as we do follow you, I pray that, that um, our lives will be infused with hope, with meaning and healing, Lord Jesus. 
Um, so once again, we commit ourselves to you. In your holy name we pray, amen. Okay, my friends, until we're together again, may the Lord bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine down upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit, amen. God bless you and we'll see you soon.